Dr. Larry brings you another segment of Did You Know? Arthritis. A long time ago, arthritis got its name and claim to fame. And now we know arthritis is as famous as Johnny Unitas used to be but is as wanted or needed as getting stung by a bumblebee. Because we've all heard somebody say, oh, I hurt with arthritis. In addition, commonly in healthcare, there's a lot of chit chat about Arthur. What causes it? Why it gives us such a fit? And the ultimate question is, when will it ever quit? Because it causes big problems in the function of our hips, knees, spines, and more. It's a type of condition that if you're in your later years, it can make you shout, and let it all out. And maybe that's what Tears for Fears was singing about, because arthritis we can definitely do without. So come on, all you arthritis sufferers, I'm talking to you. Come on, I have some information to sue. So if you have arthritis, then pay close attention to our next guest. She's a practicing physician and board certified in a field that deals with this. It's a show you will not want to miss because I'm bringing you a specialist. So for the sake of simplicity, We'll call this segment, Ask the Rheumatologist. Dr. Sethi, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Dr. Nari, for having me here. I appreciate that. Yeah, and uh, we were talking before we started uh, to get this fired up today. And for everybody listening, they know over the last couple of weeks, I've been talking about you on the radio. So we've got a rheumatologist coming on WIKB and live on the airs uh, and the air coming up. And, uh, you know, I'm I'm probably equally as excited as they are. And some of the folks that have been coming to the office, I just had a lady in yesterday. She says, I'll be listening because she had a question that dealt with uh, potentially an autoimmune problem that may relate to exactly where we're going to go over today. But uh, I think the key is first, uh, and this is the first time you've been on the show, is what I'd like you to do is just give us your full name, your license type, uh, any certifications or board search you have uh, would be great. Yeah, so my full name is Manpreet Kaur Sethi. I'm a board certified uh, physician in internal medicine as well as rheumatology. And I'm licensed to practice in Wisconsin and working here at OSMS. Okay, and uh, where did you uh, do your undergrad and where did you go to medical school? So my undergrad and medical school, that happened in India. And after that, I gave US MLEs to come here and did residency in New Jersey and fellowship in Nebraska. Excellent. And uh, before, you know, you decided to become a physician and choose your subspecialty, uh, give us a little history of, of why you chose to get into this particular field itself. Um, so rheumatology, you know, if there is anything like stars alignment or anything like that, I think that's what happened to with me in as far as the rheumatology is concerned. Uh, I always wanted to be a physician. I think when I was in second grade, my mom tells me that I have been saying I will be a doctor since then. Um, and with rheumatology, what happened is that my first very clinical rotation in, in med school, the first patient that I ever saw was a patient who had scleroderma, which is, yes, like a, a condition that not many people have heard about. But to simplify it, I would say that was a devastating condition for that lady who was young who lost her job and her husband left her because of that as well. And it made so much impact on me on what one condition could do that I wanted to find out more and treat it. You know, so from a scientific standpoint, I found it fascinating because in rheumatology, there is so much that we need to know and we know and there are so many medications. But at the same time, there is so much unknown at the same time and how each person you know, is different from the other person as a patient and their disease is different than the other person with the same disease. And I think that right now that I practice it, what I love the most is that with patients, in patients with rheumatology related conditions, these conditions are chronic. Like we don't just see them once or twice. It's a lifelong relationship basically, which I love. Like it's basically like growing all together with the patients. Yeah, and you know, I'm glad you, I'm glad you brought that up in the way you did because there's the the, this is the career you wanted to choose, but then there's also that kind of the very human component, and uh, the getting exposed to that type of patient with scleroderma, which we actually have a case or two locally in the area here. In fact, I think uh, one mm-hmm. one of the folks went down and 
I'm not sure if they saw you or not, but they went to OSMS, saw one of the rheumatologists there specifically to see if they had it or not because it was in the family gene. But and 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 even like I mentioned before too, I I started out I led in with arthritis, but rheumatology is a wide scope of things that you see and treat, scleroderma being one of them, myositis is another one on the list, and we're going to jump into some of those down a little bit later in the interview. But um, ultimately, I think that's getting into the field of dealing with people one-on-one, like you said, more so just for uh, kind of a lifetime, because these are chronic conditions that can come up. Uh, you're, you're, mm-hmm. you're walking them through these things, and then you, you have to be somewhat, as you know, You've got to take the the science component of it. What you know works. Be objective as you can, but ultimately you're still kind of maneuvering with some of these patients in a bit of a gray zone and having to kind of, I would imagine, coming up with unique care plans for folks with things you maybe not even necessarily uh, know exactly the the right angle on them, but have to figure out as as life goes on with them, which is makes it mm-hmm. kind of a very wide open, unique field. Um, as far as uh, you know, before we get into the meat of the interview here, I always like to ask this question. I think it's I think it's semi important because you know as you're as we're we're talking together here too, it immediately can tell just the the genuine quality of of your approach to to medicine. But give us one unique personal talent or hobby or interest you had. Um, if you play an instrument or something that you like to do, maybe in your spare time that we would all like to to maybe hear or know about. A little teaser. What is Dr. Sethi's famous dish? We're going to talk food. Learning from this rheumatologist for just a few minutes, and then we'll get into everything we need to. You're listening to the Dr. Larry Radio Show. We'll be right back. Dr. Larry. Dr. Larry. We'll be back. Back in a moment. Break over. over. Time to get cracking once again with Dr. Larry. Welcome back. Dr. Sethi is just getting us warmed up by talking about food. Bon appetit. And then we will get into the meat of the show. Roll tape. Give us one unique personal talent or hobby or interest you had. If you play an instrument or something that you like to do maybe in your spare time that we would all like to to maybe hear or know about. Oh, I'm not talented at all, I say. I... um... So I don't cook, but I think I'd make very good butter chicken if anybody wants to try it, um, which I don't know if many people know what that is, but it's like chicken with a lot of butter and sauce and gravy. Um, I think the only talent that I can think of that I really have is I am a very fast reader. I read my books from top to bottom rather than left to right, which is slowing down with age, but I think I'm still pretty proud of myself on how much I can read in a given time. So wait a second. And as far as like, in, oh, I'm sorry. So you you yeah. take you take and you can look at a book and go straight down from top to bottom instead of the scan the typical way left to right. Yeah, and that's what I tend to do. Like I'm, I wouldn't say that I'm like very fast at doing that, but that's how I read top to bottom. And was that something that you developed as you were going through school, or did you always have it since you were you were little? I, I don't know. I think that I realized during residency when other people said they couldn't finish the exam. And I was like, what, yeah, what are you talking about? Like, why do I always come out of the exam finishing it like two hours or three hours earlier? I never had problem finishing. Like, everybody would say that was a long stem of the question. And I'm like, what do you mean? Yeah. You know, and then I realized that I think I read differently. Int- I never even knew that I did it. <laughs> Yeah, because so there it goes. It was kind of just a, innate and natural for you as well too. It was that one of those uh, things too. Even when you're you're uh, so if you're reading through medical records and you got a stack in front of you or reading, flipping through the computer, do you find it's the same thing? Like if you're going through somebody's case history, yeah. could, could, do things just kind of jump out at you if, in a more of a column format versus left and right? Yes, I, like I, I I would say that because I know that a couple of patients, you know, sometimes they bring like uh, symptom list or something written. And then I would scan and sometimes they would be like, did, you know, I, I could, I can see it on their face that they're like, did I read it? Because that's how I scan. And then I would ask the question that was written, let's say on the eighth line. And they were like, oh, you noticed. And like, yeah, I am just a fast reader. I paid attention. Which I'll tell you, because I've done some shows. Uh, I, I, I do a, a mixture of different types of shows. I'll talk about, you know, case specific, bringing on uh, medical professionals. But also I'll talk about just kind of healthcare stuff. Specifically from the standpoint of information, retention, doctors going through studies out there about when you go see a physician, when they're reading your stuff, uh, how much are they retaining, how much are they 
able to put down when you're giving them information. Is that information accurate? I've gone through all that stuff in, in uh, several shows before. And, and one of the things that kind of bubbles to the surface right now is the fact that it's absolutely key that as you're working through your day and everybody that comes to see you, that's their visit with you, even though you may have a full docket and pa- patients coming, everybody, this is their time, their moment. And to, to the extent, mm-hmm. yep, to the extent that you can be able to decipher the important information and then also retain it in, in a way th- as if you had been reading it for hours is really kind of a, a unique skill in and of itself with the pace of things go as it goes nowadays and be able to figure out problems. So I'll call that a personal unique talent. So, okay, what I'd like to do is I'd like you to briefly describe and discuss what a rheumatologist does. And uh, and also, too, as you're thinking and answering this question, maybe three or four common reasons uh, why a patient would see a rheumatologist. But first, just kind of give us an overview of, of a rheumatologist. So I think that you probably, you know, explained it very well, that yes, it all starts with arthritis because that's what, you know, most people know about rheumatology or joint diseases. But when it comes to rheumatology, we, as I would like to say, that there is not just one kind of arthritis. There are like tens of hundreds of arthritis that can happen from different conditions. And that can be just one part of their whole disease or their whole self. Uh, because many of the diseases that we see in rheumatology that can affect them systemically, meaning um, in different organs, like the same thing can affect their lungs, brain, heart, kidneys. Um, So it's, um, and I I think that's why probably I enjoy it more because it's the whole patient. It's not just one specific area. But yes, inflammatory arthritis or arthritis related to inflammation that causes swelling and stiffness in the joints is something that brings attention, you know, to the patient or even for the patient brings attention to their disease that something is going on with them. Um, Would would you... So then in a way, are you? it's almost like you're a bit of like internal medicine, a bit of almost pri- what a primary care would do, but with a, a hyper focus on the inflammation, uh, inflammatory component of the joints. I, I would agree with that statement uh, that, yes, you know, it, and that is why, you know, there is internal medicine training that goes in before rheumatology specialty training. And I do think that going through that, through the full three years of internal medicine training actually helps prepare for rheumatology. You're absolutely right. Uh, that yes, it's more honed in, it's more specialized, uh, but we have to know many things about different organ systems, different medications, because of the medications that we prescribe sometimes can have interactions as well. So as far as the, the three, maybe the four common reasons uh, that a patient would want to see or make an appointment with a rheumatologist, what would those be? So again, a most common reason that any, you know, pain is always the most common thing that anybody would experience or pay attention to. So in general, like a pain in the joints along with swelling in the joints, so things like rheumatoid arthritis and gout, they will catch anybody's attention and they would see a rheumatologist. Uh, but other people who also may have some different kind of disorders going on and perhaps uh, there is no unifying diagnosis, but things like muscle weakness. And sometimes muscle weakness can be related to autoimmunity, just like you previously mentioned, myositis. Um, or if there is more, more than one organ being involved at the same time in somebody's disease, like lungs are involved and kidneys involved at the same time, and we don't know what that is. And sometimes those can be linked to conditions that a rheumatology can help treat. A rheumatologist can help treat, like vasculitis, for example. From a diagnostic perspective, uh, this is one thing that I always relate to a patient if I'm mentioning to see a rheumatologist. And I give them almost one or two sentence sort of theme. I say, a rheumatologist really knows how to run labs and look for stuff. Would that be an accurate statement? Um, and, and what I mean by that is, is sometimes in the primary care setting, yes, they're going to run your, your standard panel of labs and maybe they'll see some stuff, maybe they won't. But I always say when it, when it comes to seeing a rheumatologist, you, you all seem to have a really uh, kind of a better perspective on how to look and run for different types of labs. Is that, is that one of the tools that you lean on um, besides, obviously, history, exam, et cetera, uh, it, would it be from a lab perspective or, or would it be from diagnostic imaging or, or kind of all of the above? 
have I would definitely say that in rheumatology it's definitely all the above. We cannot survive without any one factor. In fact I'm gonna say that in rheumatology it's really the history and exam that probably trumps like everything else. So when we do labs it's more for confirmation or ruling out rather than like thinking about what the problem could be. And imaging is only used when we think that okay it doesn't match with what I'm thinking, so I need imaging. Uh, but it's really the history and physical and the pattern recognition because many of our diseases that we see, they don't have very specific labs. So people can have some positives and may not be related to what we are treating or vice versa that we are treating. And, you know, just like you said, like we are treating and people have rheumatoid arthritis, but none of that shows up in the blood work sometimes. Got it. And I'm glad that you said it that way. I'm, I'm a, a big proponent. I've been in practice for 22 years and uh, of history and exam. Uh, I think those are, like you said, Trump's labs and diagnostic imaging. One of the things that I always tell patients, too, is that you, what I'm doing right now is I'm assessing uh, and, and addressing and focusing on from a historical perspective, present day, and when I come up with ortho neuro and uh, experience to try to come up with a diagnosis before we even do anything else or make a referral. We should have a working knowledge already, and then everything mm -hmm. else just kind of adds on or is an ancillary tool. And I have found, too, like you said, yeah. when, when, when patients come back from a rheumatologist, okay. they will report back to me and say that was a long visit, extended exam, and it's one of the things they typically do. And then they, they'll add in this thing, which I found over the years. And they, by the way, Dr. Lay, they, they ran some labs that my primary care just uh, didn't, didn't do too. So that's maybe what you're doing too. Like you said, you're doing that the first two components, which weight everything, and then just kind of looking. And like you said, sometimes things just don't even show up in labs. Um, is uh, mm -hmm. Would you, so then I guess that, that does kind of tie in to, to a, a, a little third question I want to ask here is, Compare and contrast, let's say, internal medicine, primary care, uh, role responsibility, and then as a rheumatologist. Because I think sometimes, too, when people say, oh, I, I need to see a rheumatologist, um, or, or in a sense, like you've mentioned, gout, I know that sometimes in the primary, or quite often in the primary care setting, they're, they're handling the gout. But when would a patient, let's say, we'll just use gout for an example. Let's say that somebody's got gout and they're seeing their primary care doc. When would it be one of those discussions where the primary care doctor or the patient says, I think, I think I need to see a rheumatologist for this? Uh, if you can compare and contrast a little bit between internal medicine, primary care, and specifically when it would be wise for a patient to, to, give, you, to give a call. So if you're listening, what I'm doing here is I'm having Dr. Sethi answer for us when to call. Sometimes we know when to call an orthopedic surgeon uh, or when we think we might. Sometimes we know when to call um, primary care, uh, neurologist. But I'm trying to handle kind of a hazy concept of when a rheumatologist would come into play when it comes to your health care, when to call them, when it's wise. So Dr. Sethi is going to answer that question in just a few minutes when we get back from the break. Stay tuned. This is the Dr. Larry Radio Show. We'll be right back. We'll be right back, back, back with Dr. Larry. We're, we're back, back with Dr. Larry. Welcome back. If you're just tuning in, I have Dr. Sethi on the show, a board-certified rheumatologist who practices at OSMS. That's orthopedic and sports medicine specialist. We are discussing what a rheumatologist is and their way in which they diagnose and treat under their specialty. Roll it. So, I mean, I think um, I I would for, I will take this opportunity to thank all the primary care physicians out there, first of all, uh, because I, I think that they deserve so much more thanks from people like uh, from patients, from specialists like me, because they are the quarterback and they run the show basically, and they can identify who needs whom. With it. Um, and I appreciate that. When it comes to gout, I feel many of those cases can definitely be managed in primary care setting because many of the primary care physicians are very comfortable managing the medications that we use in rheumatology. Um, none of those are immune suppressing medications. Um, I do see patients with gout uh, who are referred from primary care and the usual setting is something like uh, they started the patient on medication and uh, the patient is not better yet. So the idea is, is there something else going on? Are they on the right track? Or sometimes I see that there is a comfort level on how much dosing of the medication that can be used for gout 
uh, which I would say as a rheumatologist, uh, we go beyond the standard dosing that most people use. And I think when it comes to that level, most of the primary care physicians feel more comfortable sending the patient over to us. Or like if they have a kidney disease and they feel that the medication cannot be given or needs to be monitored specifically, then we take over sometimes. So, uh, but gout is one thing where I would say it's really collaborative. Like primary care physicians can certainly be the first contact and treat it very well and utilize rheumatology when needed. And that's I specifically brought that up for a reason because I think uh, as people are listening to you talk and answer right now, they might say, well, I'm working with my primary care, but I probably should just see the rheumatologist anyway because they really know how to handle, let's say, gout. But as you just stated, if you're comfortable with your primary care physician and things are working fine, uh, then it's not necessarily one of those things where just because you have a uh, subspecialty focused in rheumatology, if things are okay at the primary care setting, stay there. You're okay. But it's just when there's a, a, a like you said, maybe a dose specific or maybe a problematic case. And in, in, in that sense, that's when it might be where the discussion comes up. So it's not like uh, primary care uh, is not as equipped as a rheumatologist to hand a gout. They're just as fine. It's just when there might be some of these little uh, niche sort of situations there, and that's when they kind of pull you in, if, if I kind of repackage that correctly. Yes, yeah, that would be correct way to say it. Thank you. Yep. So um, now I think, and, and this is one of those things that can be a little bit of a uh, hazy concept for, for folks, and uh, one of the things that we know when we see out there as far as types and styles of treatments go, and, and as you mentioned, uh, rheumatologist exam, uh, history, of course, uh, medication, labs, but there's one specific thing or type of, of treatment you do, which is infusion treatments. And what i like for you today is to go through uh, infusion treatment because obviously those that are receiving it know what it is, but for people that aren't diagnosed yet, have a problem, end up needing this kind of thing, this would be the discussion we'd have right now for those folks of what infusion treatment is, uh, why was it developed, and how is this different than taking, let's say, an oral medication uh, for, for that? So if you can kind of go through infusion treatment in general for us first, then we'll go through some conditions as well. Okay. Um, so by infusion treatment, first of all, like I would clarify, by infusion we mean medications that we give IV. And what happened in 1950s is that we had some oral medications that were available, broad-based treatment. One example would be methotrexate. So that was a drug that was developed for cancer, eventually got it, it or found its use in rheumatology for rheumatoid arthritis, like in 1980s, much later. And we had a lot of, because of that, we had a lot of experience. We knew what to monitor for and uh, what are the toxicities involved. And that does help in so many of our patients that it's almost um, probably the most common use treatment at that. And, but it's not for everybody. There are some people who do not tolerate it or have some contraindications to it, which is when we say, okay, we need more. Uh, but when it comes to rheumatology, uh, what happened is that the diseases are complex. They are not the same. And as more advancement happened in understanding of how the disease happens, we found out that there wasn't just one chemical involved. It wasn't just one thing that was wrong. It was a complex interplay of like, several chemicals, which we like to call cytokines, but different chemicals involved in the body that cause the disease. So as we learned more about which, you know, chemical A versus chemical B was doing, uh, there was interest in stopping that chemical A versus chemical B versus the interaction between A and B. And that's how these medications started to develop. And these are called biologics, uh, simply to simplify the term. Some of these are available as injections. Some of these are available IV. Um, and then there are newer medications which are oral. They are technically not biologics, but they behave like biologics, uh, which are the newer medications that we all see advertisements for. Uh, but basically the thing with these medications that happened is that these were targeted medications. These were not general broad-based. They reacted specifically to one component in our immune system. And because of the targeted approach, they really worked well for many of our patients. And because one tar treatment target was not the same for the other person, we ended up needing like different medications that would target B, C, D, E. And that's how we keep on seeing and hearing more and more about these medications because every year 
there will be an FDA approval for a different medication. Um, and it's all, you know, the advancement in technology, molecular biology that we just know more. And thankfully, not just in rheumatology, like we have infusions or biologic treatment for eye diseases, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, MS, things like that. And as far as from a um, clinician perspective, is this one of the situations where uh, a patient comes in, they need infusion treatment, and you've got a protocol to follow, but it's one of those things, too, where you, you have to make sometimes judgment calls on uh, how to, I guess, uh, cascade the medications when it comes in, or is it pretty pretty strict as far as protocol goes, meaning this is where it's at in science, this is what we do, and we're not going to deviate from that. I mean, are there in between judgment calls you make to in order to benefit the patient for you know condition A, uh, and you've got three medications you've got to use uh, by infusion uh, and then you've got to kind of tweak the dose or, or the time of it is that is there a lot of uh, I guess I'll say the art and science when it comes to infusion treatment or is it highly scientific with with a little bit uh, very little room a uh, wiggle room in there oh no um, it's, it's like scientific in the broad base of course like if a medication is given IV we stick to IV and if it's injectable it's injectable but no, you are absolutely right because each patient is different. It all can be modified to suit the particular patient um, who has the condition. Um, like there are medications that we use and um, even for, from a rheumatology standpoint, I have medications which I can use at a certain dose in rheumatoid arthritis and a different dose in psoriatic arthritis and a different dose in Crohn's disease. So the condition also decides what the dose will be. The patient's side effects or, you know, if they have other associated conditions that I need to keep in mind, that would also decide on how I'm going to dose the medication at different times. There is no just one set protocol, although there are guidelines which we, which have been proven to be effective and we do follow that and we try to stay nearby that guideline. Makes sense. So with that in mind, what I like to do, we're going to do kind of two variations of this. I'd like to go through three conditions of uh, an infusion treatment and the medication that's used and and uh, how they work in the body, like you said, bio- uh, you said biologics, and how it interacts with uh, internal body systems and what it's trying to do. So if we can go through, and we'll be pretty objective about this, just condition one, two, and three, and then what I'd like to do is flip it. I'd like to go through successful patient cases. Patient A came in with a symptom and you diagnosed it and did a treatment for it and this was the outcome. But first I'd like to stick with the objective component which would be let's roll through three conditions where uh, you have a condition and the infusion treatment was medication and then this is what the medication intended to do. So really what it is, it's kind of a little mini sort of uh, series here and a little mini class on, on the condition, the medication, and the effect on the body. But you're going to have to wait next week to hear it. Nan and Nanner. Yes, it's going to be a cliffhanger, but it's going to be worth it. So uh, keep that in mind. We're going to go through the, the medication protocol for infusion treatment, and then we're going to go through successful cases. Now, uh, both of those together really going to highlight what a rheumatologist can do and also kind of give you that perspective that sometimes it's difficult to capture when you're there as a patient. So make sure next week you are tuned in at the same time, so we're going to go through part two of this series. Now, upcoming announcements and our tip and trick of the week just around the corner after the break. This is the Dr. Larry Radio Show. We'll be right back. Dr. Larry, Dr. Larry will be back, back in a moment. 